Fault Lines at the CBC. Hi, I'm Michelle Sterling for Friends of Science Society, and thanks for joining us tonight to have a look at the fault lines at the CBC. We're going to deconstruct a recent journal report that they had. It was on the National. It's also been floating around on YouTube, um, which is kind of an atypical form of reporting. And I wanted to also look at this report and some of the backstory. So um, thanks for joining us tonight. Let's have a look at what kinds of things we found. Climate misinformation. Are you immune? So this is the report that I want to talk about, and uh, this was done by Jayla Bernstein of CBC, and it's kind of an unusual presentation because it's not your typical stand-up, and it seems to be like she might even be in her home or a home office. But before we get into it, let's have a review of CBC's journalistic standards. The main thing is they want to serve the public interest, to contribute to the understanding of issues of public interest, to reflect diversity. They're committed to reflecting accurately the range of experiences and points of view of all citizens. They claim to be independent of all lobbies and political and economic influence, and public interest guides all of our decisions. And their mission is to act responsibly and to be accountable. We are aware of the impact of our work and are honest with our audience. Well, let's see if that's true. Just before we get into it, let's remind ourselves the journalistic questions, the five W's and H. So these are basic journalism features that every journalist knows. You, When you're doing a story, you have to answer who, what, where, when, why, and how. And, you know, what's really important here is why is this happening and why is it important? Why does it impact our lives? And in terms of climate policy, how does it impact our lives? So this was an unusual reporting format, in my opinion. And um, Jayla Bernstein begins sitting in a chair. And I just want to say I'm, I'm sorry that I have to publicly critique Jayla's work this way. I'm sure she was trying to do the best job she could, but I don't think that it was the best job for the public interest from CBC. And I'll tell you why as we go through. So she's going through her phone saying, I've been doing a lot of scrolling. I see false claims and cherry picking on climate change. And there's this kind of interesting set prop. It is 30 minutes past 12. You know, sort of the doomsday clock thing. And Jayla talks about these posts are getting thousands of views. Now, this woman is not identified in the CBC broadcast. Who is this woman? Why would we show her? So people are objecting to the fact that there's almost a quarter of a million views, but we don't even know who she is, right? Well, I know who she is. It's Joanne Nova. And Joanne says everything you know about climate change is the opposite. And Jayla says, well, I report on climate change, so I know these claims are false. And then we have a cutaway of her boots walking through the frame, which that's really an unusual kind of approach to news. And next we go to this claim that 61% of Canadians are very or extremely sure that climate change is happening. Well, Jayla's 61% public opinion social proof is misleading and irrelevant. Climate change has been happening for 4.5 billion years. The issue is to what extent do human industrial emissions drive climate change? Is carbon dioxide the driver or not? Like, who cares what Canadians are extremely sure about? What does the data and evidence tell us? That's what science is about. It's not about opinions. And normally you would explain the story with facts and not passing social proofs. Again, this fellow pops up, although his name is written here, Matthew Levine, misinformation researcher at McGill, 
um, it's not clearly identified who he is or what his report is about, which I had to dig around and find at Media Ecosystem Observatory, Mis- and Disinformation During the 2021 Canada Federal Election. Now, you know, that's an important element. Why wasn't that made clearer to us? And then this fellow pops up. Who is this man? And why is his contribution to this story relevant? And he says, kind of from out of the blue, it's very easy by misleading rhetoric to induce doubt about those facts in the public because you know the public doesn't have enough time to sort through and sift through all the information that's out there. Informa misinformation can have a very strong impact on people's attitudes. Boom, and now we're in a cafe with Jayla. Why? And she tells us misinformation is all about planting little seeds of doubt. It might not be enough to make okay, but there's no facts there, are there? If we look at the facts and evidence, it's clear that for Canada, cutting emissions is not worth the effort because the Canadian contribution to is 0 0.019 degrees Celsius and the Alberta contribution is 0 0.006 degrees Celsius. That's six thousandths of a degree. So it's not worth the effort. And that's not misinformation. That's fact, evidence, data. It's um, based on a world of long-term assessments. And that assessment was done by William Van Wingarden. He's a professor at York University. He uh, studies a number of things. He's a very well-respected scientist, and he also studies climate change. Here he did uh, an assessment of over a billion data points in Canada. And yes, we are warming, but look, we're warming in winter. He also wrote this little book called Is Global Warming Hot Air, which you can find online and uh, download the PDF free of charge. So. That's who did that um, analysis of our contribution to warming. But here's how CBC described Professor William Van Wingarden in a previous story about the seven young people who sued the Ontario uh, province over its climate policy. Um, they said, Ontario brings in a climate change denier. That's how they talked about this professor a climate change denier. That's bullying. That's name-calling. So we did a four-part series debunking eco-justice and CBC's derogatory coverage of an esteemed Canadian scientist. And when we post this uh, PowerPoint online, you'll be able to follow the link. Or you can just go to our blog and find it by, by uh, going by the name there. So it looks like CBC doesn't look at the evidence. They're too busy smearing qualified people who are bringing you the evidence that the claim of a climate emergency is overwrought and built on a contrived consensus. So I personally know this woman who appears in the CBC uh, report. Her name is Joanne Nova, and I also know this research very well because I participated in a report about it. So Joanne Nova in this clip says, they tell us 97% of climate scientists agree, but they don't tell us that's only 75% or that's only 75 people. <laughs> so note that CBC does not identify this woman or the study that she refers to. What does that mean? Well, that, that means that you can't go and find out what you think about it. If they quote the study, the name of the study is Doran and Zimmerman, 2009. So if they uh, posted that, you could go and find that study, read it, see for yourself, is Joanne Nova telling the truth or not? Um, they don't post Joanne Nova's name. So you can't find her award-winning blog, where she's been blogging about science issues for, I think, well over a decade, probably more like 20 years. Um, so they're preventing you from evaluating whether or not CBC is giving you misinformation or not. Let's go on. 
So you see, here we are together, Joanne Nova and I, um, for Friends of Science Society's 19th Annual Climate Science Event. And this event was with Joanne Nova telling us how to destroy a perfectly good electricity grid in one million expensive steps. And she's from Australia. And what's happened down there, of course, they've gone very heavily into renewables and their power grid is collapsing. They have frequent significant blackouts. Uh, there are very large industries there like aluminum industries where the blackouts have caused tremendous damage, financial damage, mechanical damage to the um, company because uh, especially with aluminum you have to keep it, it uh, liquid at a very high temperature so if the power goes out and your factory shuts down well you're in trouble you've got a big pot of solid aluminum that you can't do a lot with so you know these are the risks that she has been trying to warn us about and yet CBC won't even tell you her name but they'll put her in a story and smear her as misinformation so let's go on here. So Joanne Nova was right. And this is the report that I was referring to that I participated in. It's one of the first reports that I worked on when I started working with Friends of Science Society. Um, you know, our question was, what about this 97% consensus? And um, I remember I had asked our research director, Ken Gregory, who's a professional engineer, I said, you know, how can they keep coming up with 97%? Like I had worked in marketing before I knew that, you know, if you come up with 97% claims about things, people usually are won over because it sounds like, oh, everybody's on board with that. Let's go along with it. But it, it floored me that all of these different studies that use different questions, different groups, different methods, and uh, different uh, content all came up with 97%. And so I said, how can it be? And, uh, you know, I'm not very good with numbers myself. And, and of course, Ken is. And he said, well, you know, they just make it that way. So I, I didn't understand it. But when we did this report together, I did understand it. And I'll show you this example. So here's the, the uh, paper in question, Doran and Zimmerman, 2009. And it uh, surveyed, uh, originally they sent a two-question survey to 10,257 respondents. And of those, 3,069 uh, responded. And of those, uh, 77 claim to be climate uh, climate scientists are writing and publishing on climate change. So that became their base, was the 77 people who claimed to be publishing in climate. And then they asked them these two opinion questions, and 75 of the 77 said yes to both questions. So that's your 97% consensus. So let's look at it. So here's one of the questions. When compared with pre-1800 levels, do you think that mean global temperatures have generally risen, fallen, or remained relatively constant? Well, that's an opinion question. <laughs> you know, science is about empirical measurements, things that other people can also come and measure the same way. So things that are wrong with it, the question does not mention any human-caused reason for a rise in temperature. Therefore, it cannot rightly be said to show any consensus of the IPCC AGW declaration. Most geologists would agree that temperatures have risen because since 1880, the Earth has been warming out of the cold period known as the Little Ice Age. And you can see that over here. This is the modern warm period. And you can see right before that was the Little Ice Age. And you can see in the past there has been cyclical warming, cooling, warming, cooling. It's a pattern. It's not, um, it, it's, it, it's not something that is exactly the same. It's cyclical, but we don't exactly know what causes these cycles. And the cause is the subject of debate. But the warming to 1940 
could not have been caused by CO2 emissions because these emissions were too low, meaning that we were only using some coal and, you know, just beginning to use oil and gas. So the emissions were quite low. And, you know, people talk about pre-industrial times. So they're talking around 1880, 1860, 1850, to 1860 were these. So that's not very equidistant, is it? So it's very hard to say exactly what the temperature was before 1860. So geologists, geoscientists, you know, are, are quite skeptical of climate hysteria because past climatic changes are cyclical and very dramatic. Earth scientists, that's geologists, geophysicists, geochemists, they study 4.5 billion years of climate change, not just 150 years. So this is a graph from uh, Dr. Harper's presentation, which he did for us a few years ago. And um, you can see that temperatures go from very hot to very cold. This is during a 600 million year period. That's when you get salt flats and things like that. And then it goes back down again, tropical, temperate, glaciation, and repeat. So if we look back at the Doran and Zimmerman um, report or paper, they were assessing Earth scientists. And the main focus of anthropogenic global warming is from 1880 forward. And our uh, reviewing the Holocene period would likely see an overall cooling temperature in Earth's climate on the grand scale. So consequently, many of the respondents to that survey declined to participate. They felt the questionnaire was improperly phrased, it didn't include time parameters, and the survey relied on opinion and not. So geological data shows that the Earth is cooling, and it also shows that CO2 has no correlation to temperature. So this is CO2 down here, and this is temperature up here. This is from uh, Professor Ole Hamlam's work. So opinions and subjective words are not empirical measures. Questions that don't mention human-caused GHGs can't prove AGW. So likewise, the second question in the Doran and Zimmerman, Zimmerman survey was, do you think human activity is a significant contributing factor in changing mean global temperatures? Well, the word significant cannot be quantified. The IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their statement about human-caused global warming, it's that GHGs cause more than 90% of the warming. And the IPCC declaration singles out GHGs from human activity, but it doesn't ascribe all human activity, which includes land disturbance, urban warming, and black soot on snow. So neither of the two questions mentions human-caused GHG emissions, so neither can evaluate the agreement with the IPCC AGW statement. In other words, it's not a consensus survey, really. And, of course, math is hard. <laughs> so Doron and Zimmerman claimed a 97.4% consensus to this question based on a yes response by 75 out of 77 self-identified climatologists we don't know who their what their credentials are. But actually that would mean only 2.38% of the 3146 scientists who responded agree with an undefined expression of anthropogenic global warming. Here's the 97%, 75 scientists peer reviewed consensus study. So that's this here. And here's Margaret Kendall Zimmerman's MA thesis, which has this, because this paper is drawn from her survey done in her MA thesis. First of all, neither CBC nor NASA ever did the math on door. If you find a statement toward the end that says, I can honestly say that I've heard very convincing arguments from all the different sides, and I think I'm actually more neutral on the issue now than I was before I started the project. See that 37 scientists wrote emails to M.K. Zimmerman stating that the sun and oceans are the main drivers of climate change. And if you want for ease of, of reading, I extrapo 
extracted that and put them in this paper called Infiltration, which you can find on the... But, you know, uh, the, the comments are saying things like, the temperature record's not long enough to form any significant hypothesis. We can't separa out, separate out with adequate precision the different factors. Multiple lines of data suggest humans are not the first or climb. Simplifying complex questions this way is all that helpful in understanding how science is done. Most scientists acknowledge uncertainties in hypotheses. So asking black and white questions like this, you either think it is or think it isn't, you're not allowed to think that it may be. For example, I might guess that 80% of my fellow geoscientists are at least 50% sure that human activity may be at least and census studies came out when? Well, they began with Oreskes in Nomi Oreskes in um, 2004. That's probably the most famous study. And why did they start coming out? Well, this is um, uh, 73 computer model runs and this contrasts with uh, weather balloon data and um, satellite data. So this bottom line here is the weather balloon and satellite data and you can see that these observations, the climate models that project future temperatures go way off the charts, <laughs> right? And so what happened? So all these consensus surveys started coming out. Oreskes did another one in 2007, Doran and Zimmer 2009, Andre Gadel 2010, Lewandowski 2012, Lewandowski, Cook. So all of these consensus surveys are trying to prove that scientists agree that human um, human industrial emissions and CO2 cause global warming, but the actual evidence disproves that. So that's pretty interesting. Why didn't CBC tell us that? And why didn't CBC tell us that one million geoscientists agree that we are in the Meghalian age? Anthropocene? Not so much. So the International Union of Geological Sciences is, um, has over 121 national members representing over a million geoscientists. And here's their announcement about uh, the fact that we're in the Meghalian age, which was made in uh, 2019, I believe they posted that. Um, and of course, BBC was trying to say, oh, it's the Meghalian up to 1950. But um, they're explaining to the BBC that no, that's incorrect. And they also note that the proponents of the Anthropocene have never submitted a formal proposal to the Commission on Stratigraphy for evaluation. So you have to ask yourself why that is. Why would they not submit? Well, I can suggest a reason why they wouldn't, because the process requires extremely high evidentiary standards. And while it's true humans have had a significant impact on the earth during our industrial era, the changes that nature has uh, wrought upon the earth are far, far more dramatic. And that's what the um, IUGS bases its evaluations on that kind of very high standard of evidence. And just to let you know, within the IUGS, there's still a debate going on about whether it's actually the Meghalian or not. <laughs> because some people say that the evidence that they rested the definition upon was not quite stringent enough. And it's very stringent. It's well backed up. So, you know, that is the true nature of science. It's about inquiry and it's about open civil debate. Um, and, and sometimes the debate gets pretty feisty. But the point is that people generally present opposing theories, theses, uh, hypotheses, and discuss them and bring forward evidence proving or disproving. So it's not about consensus at all. It's about evidence. 
are you immune story and we find out that now they're talking about the ozone layer and they like to use the ozone layer as proof of climate action and why climate action will work um, because back in the late 80s early 90s there was an effort to uh, phase out uh, CFCs, which are a kind of gas that uh, was deemed to be causing a hole in the ozone. Um, so uh, there was a big effort to do that, and many people said that it solved the ozone hole issue um, and made things better, and therefore we should take climate action and do the same kind of dramatic change to uh, many of our policies but of course you know CFCs is one thing and climate action is completely another climate action is asking people to turn their lives upside down and lower their standard of living put themselves at risk of heat or eat poverty and none of that was relevant with the uh, use of the um, uh, Freon gases, I think it was at the time. So anyway, so they interview this scientist, uh, Susan Solomon, and she was part of the effort to uh, phase out um, these gases and stop the ozone hole. Now, you know, she's talking about how uh, climate solutions are being found and she sees them being implemented and they stick up this picture of wind farm, right? <laughs> That's not a climate solution. And then they put up more propaganda with solar farm and people biking and walking. This is not a climate solution. And I'll show you why. Because mining for critical minerals for wind and solar needs oil, gas, and coal. It's a huge consumer of oil, gas, and coal. Energy consumption of mining is 6.2% the total global energy consumption. These are the kind of machines that are being used. So if you want to make a wind farm, you're going to be burning a lot of oil, gas, and uh, coal to make these machines. So the annual global energy consumption in the mining industry is 580 million terajoules, or energy equivalent of a Hiroshima nuclear bomb going off every four seconds. And if you want the peer-reviewed study, it's over here. But this fellow, you should follow him on Twitter because um, he is a retired mining mechanic and he's got fantastic images and information, insights directly from the mining world that will turn your head around. So the other thing that happens in the CBC video is suddenly these young people pop up. They're not identified by name. Um, we don't exactly know why they're here. This young woman is doing kind of a swipe pass on her um, uh, TikTok. <laughs> it doesn't really make any sense. And this poor fellow is very concerned about the fact that we might not meet our Paris 1.5 degrees Celsius target. But the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal is a political and not a scientific target. Young people have been misled and terrified by CBC. And who are these people? Shouldn't they have a name? Really, the sleep of reason produces monsters. So this paper, which talks about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as the guardian of climate science, clearly states that although the 2 degree and 1.5 degree Celsius targets are political goals, not scientific ones, based on an ambiguous and somewhat contentious pre-industrial baseline, they were inspired by the IPCC's work and their participation in blah blah blah. But it's a political goal, not scientific. So if we miss the 1.5 degree target, it doesn't matter. And, you know, it's really important to realize that back in 2015, or just after the Paris Agreement, Ivo de Boer, who was then the head of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that's the political arm of the IPCC uh, UN complex of weather and climate assessment, he said the only way a 
2015 agreement can achieve a two degree goal is to shut down the whole global economy. And what happened the past couple of years? The whole global economy was shut down. Millions of people's lives were ruined. Um, the premise was the COVID epidemic. And certainly for a couple of weeks or a month at the beginning, before we better understood this disease, this infection, this virus, um, you know, probably made sense. But, you know, it's hard to make sense of it now when people are actually proposing that there should be things like climate lockdowns copying many of the steps that were taken during COVID. And if you look at Journal Metro out of Montreal in September of uh, 2021, there was an article published which suggested that wartime measures act should be implemented to stop climate change, that rationing should be implemented, that fuel should be rationed, that people should be limited in the amount they can travel. Um, and of course there are dozens of papers out there about how we should not have cattle or dairy cows anymore. They're going to make meat and milk in a factory uh, or they're going to make an equivalent out of like bioprotein from some mushy diseased bacteria <laughs> or you're going to have to have crickets. So you know this is a very dangerous time I think because these are not reasonable people and they're doing things that are killing people. And practically speaking, China emits in one month what Canada emits in a year and a half. So you can find that report online. Now this is from 2021. This is the map of explicit carbon prices around the world at that time. And I just layered over top here that Canada's carbon tax is now $65 a ton. But you can see most of the world, like most of the U.S. doesn't have a carbon tax. Um, their big tax is 7 bucks, 16 18 in California, $3 in Mexico, uh, Colombia it's $5, $9. Singapore it's four, you know, most of the EU it's like one dollar, fifteen, two dollars. And all of a sudden we get these big numbers like a hundred and eight dollars in Switzerland, hundred and eight in Liechtenstein, hundred and forty two dollars a ton in Sweden. Like, wow. So Canada is really uh, paying a lot of money for the carbon tax compared to most countries in the world. In fact, the problem is that we're in a very big cold country and this is where a country with a high carbon tax is most damaged by that carbon tax. So just for comparison, here's Switzerland compared to Canada. So probably a $106 a ton carbon tax doesn't really hurt you much in Switzerland. Here's Sweden compared to Canada, same thing, $142 a ton. I don't know, no skin off your nose. Liechtenstein you can't even see compared to Canada and their carbon tax is $106 a ton. So let's ask ourselves, is there another reason why CBC chose to mock Joanne Nova? Well, perhaps or maybe I'm just wearing a tinfoil hat. But Joanne Nova, here's her blog, she did have this article called Is the Sun Driving Ozone and Changing the Climate? So the central mystery in climate science is the sun. And then she goes on to talk about Stephen Wilde's hypothesis uh, that the sun affects the ozone layer through changes in UV or charged particles. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing because it's too much time for us. But that might be why they tried to delegitimize Joanne Nova because she's posting things that even show the ozone layer thing might not have been based on solid science. But let's go back to CBC's climate misinformation. Are you immune? So we get quite far into this about seven minute 
CBC story, and finally at 3 minutes and 39 seconds, CBC mentions the Fault Line report, a recent Canadian report. So that's what it's all about. Well, why didn't she say so? And they talk about doubt was manufactured long past the time when scientific consensus was reached. Well, we've seen that scientific consensus is a non-issue. So what, what we find here, I'm going to kind of redo how the report could have gone, okay? Because this report goes. It goes like this. You'd have the reporter uh, probably in front of a building, maybe in front of an office, uh, in an office entryway. This is where the Canadian Council of Academies uh, is located. What a splashy office, right? Look at this marble entree. Beautiful. Hi, I'm Jayla Bernstein for CBC News, reporting from the Canadian Council of Academies. The Council's newest report, Fault Lines, tackles concerns about climate change misinformation. I talked with one of the expert panel members, Professor Stephen Lewandowski, Chair, Cognitive Psychology and Professor, School of Psychological Science, University of Bristol in the UK. The Canadian Council of Academies has been funded by the federal government for about $55 million since 2002. In this latest report, Fault Lines, they single out the Calgary-based nonprofit Friends of Science Society, and in this video, I'll be showing you other climate change deniers who Professor Lewandowski says lead people to take climate change less seriously and to be less willing to support policy action. In reading Fault Lines, I noticed that the Council of Canadian Academies expressed concern about Friends of Science Society's funding. In searching their website, I found documents from their AGM showing that Friends of Science Society operates on about $150,000 a year with average member donor contributions of $100. Their billboards contradict the consensus view on climate change. I also found that in 2014, Friends of Science Society had called for the Journal of Psychological Science to retract the controversial paper by Professor Lewandowski titled NASA Faked the Moon Landing on grounds that it violated publishing ethics for a faulty consensus premise and especially that it violated the publisher's commitment to freedom of speech. Their bid was unsuccessful. From the release, Lewandowski et al. claim their research reveals that those who question anthropogenic global warming or climate science are wacky conspiracy theorists. From Friends of Science 2014 press release, in an era when bullying and social ostracization are recognized as serious crimes and psychologically damaging, it is odd that the premier publication of the Association for Psychological Science agrees to publish the Lewandowski work under this inflammatory title, says Ken Gregory, research director of Friends of Science, a climate science review organization. Thousands of legitimate scientists and citizens have been mocked and ostracized. And this same approach appears to underlie the recent Fault Lines report by the Canadian Council of Academies, which does not countenance rational scientific dissent on public policy. Further research reveals that hard-nosed skepticism is integral to responsible scientific inquiry. So this is a quote from the National Academies. Science has progressed through a uniquely productive marriage of human creativity and hard-nosed skepticism of openness to new scientific contributions and persistent questioning of those contributions and the existing scientific consensus. It turns out that it's a form of type 2 scientific misconduct to call people deniers and not engage in evidence-based scientific debate. So this is from a study by Caballet and it's, um, it's a type 2 scientific misconduct to gravely discredit someone else's research as despicable. 
CBC also delegitimizes a distinguished scientist, Professor Howard Cork Hayden. Again, they don't mention his name or qualifications, but here are some of his qualifications. He's a member of the CO2 Coalition. And in the interview clip they show, he says, I wouldn't see anything wrong with 2,000 parts per million CO2. Well, that must have sent them into a tizzy. But here's the full podcast. He's talking with Tom Nelson. And in the podcast, he shows how the IPCC is wrong in a crucial calculation. Professor Hayden challenges the IPCC with a scientific challenge, but you know, in the CBC report, they said that Professor Lewandowski is talking about this body of evidence, climate science denial creates polarization, erodes trust in science, and undermines support for cutting emissions. It's gotten bad enough that the UN flagged misinformation in its report as limiting climate change. Well, this report is from what's called Working Group 2. This is not the Physical Sciences report. Um, working Group 1 is the Physical Sciences Report, and they only mention crisis and emergency once in their AR6 report in reference to media coverage, not science. <coughs> and so if you go further into the Fault Lines Report, you find that um, they give some advice on how to make more persuasive communications. Sorry, I just have to have a drink of water here. So it seems like fault lines is a kind of teaching tool, and this odd CBC story by Jayla Bernstein is a model for others. Narrative storytelling rather than reporting. And this discusses that method here. So we'd like to thank John Robson at Climate Discussion Nexus for the heads up on fault lines. He compares the report to the Babylon Bee, and he's also sad that his um, Climate Discussion Nexus was left out. <laughs> There was a time when CBC did cover dissenting views. Can you believe it? In 2004, they did this show, Doomsday Called Off. And it featured our first scientific advisor, actually, Sally Baliunas, who was with Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics at the time. We'd like to thank Norm Kalmanovich, professional geophysicist, for this information. And of course, um, Norm sent along this information that uh, in 2004 the documentary Doomsday Called Off uh, had comments from accredited scientists including Dr. Baliunas um, and she questioned why flawed models are used for making these policies and two years later the CBC called all these scientists deniers. One thing that I found very concerning about the report by CBC is uh, later on they say that they reported all these bits and pieces to these social media networks and including Twitter but they just got replies from um, these uh, TikTok, YouTube and Meta. And to me it's very concerning that CBC has appointed itself judge and jury on content telling social medias to take down content, social media companies to take down content. We at Friends of Science are being censored and we're being censored more so now than in the past and more so since this report came out I have to wonder if CBC also reported us. Actually, you know, that would be really that would really be disgusting because you know, we're taxpayers we're paying for the CBC so are they actually using our money against us? and destroying freedom of speech, freedom of scientific inquiry. Well, we don't know. We'd have to probably do a FOIA um, or FOIA them or whatever. It costs a lot of money, wastes a lot of time, but they shouldn't be doing it in my opinion. So, you know, this is a video that we did precisely because I was so frustrated with the media. We sent out the Clintel initial press release to more than 500 media outlets in Canada and some in the US. Nobody posted it. So I just took it and read it on camera. Well, boom! We suddenly had, uh, at the time, we had half a million views. 
and then Facebook started blocking it and they still block it but over time it has still reached um, 732,000 views 29,000 likes and 5,584 comments and you can go online to Clintel um, in, it's based in the Netherlands they now have over 1,500 scientists and scholars who are signatory and who state clearly that there's no climate emergency and they provide their scientific evidence to show you why they think that. So we have to ask the question was the fault, lights re fault lines report meant to be justification for social media platforms for the Canadian government censorship under Bill C-11 and potentially Bill C-36? If so, the report does not meet the standard for scientific quality in any way, shape, or form. And as John Robson said, the solution couldn't be more patronizing if the report were Babylon B satire. If you want to know what the scientific method really is, this is an excellent reference tool. It's a book by uh, J. Scott Armstrong and Keston C. Green, both of whom who have been studying the scientific method for years. So in, in principle, the, the scientific method and peer-reviewed papers should be looking at important problems, building on prior knowledge, they should provide full disclosure, use objective designs, use valid and reliable data, use valid simple methods, use experimental evidence, and draw logical conclusions. So you've seen in this uh, deconstruction of the CBC report that um, I don't think many of these parameters are met by the fault lines report. And if CBC had done a real job, they would have noted that subverting science academies for political ends is historically known as Lysenkoism. So it's hard to believe that the Royal Society of Canada, the Canadian Academy of Engineering, the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences all support uh, this, the uh, Canadian Council of Academies. Like, how can they? <laughs> and just to clarify my comment about Lysenkoism, Mao Zedong adopted Lysenko's method, and 36 million people died in China, and cancel culture made that all possible. So does this sound um, kind of present time? That if you defy or challenge the state um, party line, then um, it's a right deviating conservatism. Anyone who dared question the accuracy of reported crop yields risked being labeled a doubter or denier. Anyone engaged in casting aspersions on the excellent situation or anyone who exposed the fraudulence of the high yield model was subjected to struggle and if you're not familiar with this period of history, struggle refers to uh, how uh, at that time under Mao, the Chinese you, partisans used to gather a dissenter in the middle of a circle and push the person around the circle until they either agreed to comply with the uh, party line or they fell down and then they were kicked and beaten sometimes to death. Um, and you can see that same thing happening in society today with cancel culture. So we're not maybe physically beating people up, or not so much at this time, but um, we're certainly not having open civil debate. And there's a very interesting quote by Amartya Sen, who did a study on democracy, and he and his colleagues found that around the world, wherever there was freedom of speech and freedom of the press, even in very So now some good news that you won't see on CBC. I hope you will one day, but you won't see it right now. So the good news is the climate emergency is over, and we do have time. How can I possibly say that? Well, it's because as Roger PLK Jr. and Justin Ritchie and uh, another one of their colleagues uh, found out, scientists have been using an implausible set of scenarios called RCP 8.5 and RCP 6. And we have a report on our website about this 
uh, that Robert Lyman did. So I'm not going to go into the details of what these are about. You can look that up. But look what happens if we take these away. You see, there's no climate emergency. And, in fact, in the latest IPCC report, the Physical Sciences Report of um, August 2019, the Working Group 1 report, they also do not foresee a catastrophe as they once did because they're using less and less of this RCP 8.5. And many scientists have known for a long, long time that CO2 is not a control knob that can fine-tune climate. And in fact, since we live in a democracy, there's actually a broad spectrum of views on climate change, ranging from people who are completely unconcerned about it, they're more concerned about health care, education, economy, jobs, trade, immigration, or global terrorism, people who are concerned about pollution, about human impacts on climate, about climate and pollution, but they want to see a cost-benefit analysis. Then we have people who are worried about climate change, but they find the message is very confusing and contradictory, like, why does Al Gore fly so much? If there was warming and cooling before, how is this different? There are some people who are angry that people think the economy matters over climate and the future of the planet. And they say, well, what about my kids? So they'd be very angry at these people. And there are others who are completely terrified of a climate apocalypse. And so they might decide to go vegan or not have children, not to drive. They might engage in other kinds of personal sacrifice to save the planet. But the thing is, we're all on the planet together. So we have to find some way to discuss these things and find some middle ground. Now, as far as Friends of Science is concerned, we stand up for open civil debate and full cost-benefit analysis on climate and energy policies. And we ask people to argue the science and don't be a climate bully. We're now celebrating our 21st year of operation. So if you'd like to help us out, because we didn't get $55 million from the federal government since 2002, like the Council of Canadian Academies did, and we don't get $1.2 billion a year from the feds like CBC does, um, and we do only operate on $150,000 a year or so from our members, <laughs> if you'd like to help us out, even $21 to celebrate as we enter our 21st year would be very helpful. And you can send an e-transfer to contact at friendsofscience.org. Now, also, if you'd like to see what we've done historically, you could go way back in time and watch Climate Catastrophe Cancelled. It's uh, in three parts on our uh, YouTube channel. So you could start there with the first part. And, you know, if you can help us educate the public, that would be great. So you can join us, you can donate, you can sponsor some of our work, you could sponsor a show like this, and you can just share our stuff. If you want to donate online, you can. If you want to join, you can do that here. If you don't want to enter your credit card, you can call the office. And you can also just donate by e-transfer. So, um... That pretty much wraps up my presentation for this evening. I appreciate all the people who joined us. Uh, we do have a bit of time now, so if there are questions, I'll just uh, stand by and uh, see what questions might be sent to me, and I'll try and answer them for you. If I can't answer them, I'll try and give you some direction as to where you can find the information. And of course, you can always put comments down below. You can also send comments into our office and uh, one of us will try and answer you or send you some links to material that's relevant. So uh, let me just uh, click off here for a moment and I'll see if I have some questions. So let's look and see. Have any questions coming in here? Okay, I don't see any questions. Okay, no questions. All right, so 
on that note, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And if you're enjoying the recorded live stream, I hope that you will also quit Paris and uh, maybe quit watching CBC. <laughs> Or write them letters and ask them to improve their work um, and stop misinforming the public. It's tragic what's happening to our young people. Anyway, that's my spiel for this evening. For Friends of Science Society, I'm Michelle Sterling. Thank you. <laughs>